Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcade Economics on quite an exciting day, Saturday afternoon. What is today's date? January 30th. Um, and certainly for anyone who's been following Silver for any period of time, uh, some very interesting things happening. Perhaps since uh, this has begun, I mean, even decades ago, maybe the cl right, closest. Chris Whoops. Marcus here with you. We'll get the thing muted in the background there so that I can still see your comments as we go along here. Um, but yeah, this is really, uh, I and mean, there've been many times where it's, it's some, in some ways this is so obvious when you can see it. I mean, so for the people who have been following this for years, it's kind of clear. Um, but when does it something actually happening? And gee, it sure seems like that's happening now. Obviously, there's a lot of other things going on in the world as well. But as you know, with uh, GameStop being and the short squeeze there, spread to a couple other stocks, and um, now has spread to silver. And since we run a silver channel here where we dig into stuff like that, I actually even wrote a book about it. Let's see if we can get uh, darn green screen the big silver short in there somewhere there's what it looks like so i've been studying this for about a decade and i would like to say congratulations to the folks uh, either in uh, wall street bets or reading uh the wall street bets forum or reading the coverage of that which i might add and i'll pull up um we even had in the uh Wall Street Journal even covered uh, silver yesterday, which was quite unusual. So, but perhaps more significantly, there's one other thing that I want to pull up here about how many shares of First Majestic you're allowed to buy. We'll get to that one. <laughs> um, but in terms of what really counts and the data, on the first day, maybe first full day, that this attention has spread to the short position in silver. And yes, it is quite a massive short position as you're finding out, probably don't need me to tell you, but I'll help put it right in a little context today, hopefully. Because uh, Bob Coleman, first one that I saw report this last night, SLV just added 37 million shares to the trust today, which is absolutely huge. Uh, as the final numbers came in, it looks like it's closer to 34 million, still a record. And let's put that baby in perspective because here, if you look at last 20 years, okay, we'll look at the one day. Okay. Now Nick Laird, <laughs> you had to redraw the chart. It didn't used to go up to 35 million ounces, but that spike is what you saw yesterday. And what that represents is, I know a lot of people are talking about SLV. Uh, keep in mind, there's also PSLV, which is the Sprott Silver Trust. And for anyone new to the game, I would say there's a big difference between the two. Um, I would not put money in SLV. I don't own PSLV, but I would feel a lot more comfortable with it. Um, again, you can decide what you want, although I would add that felony bank JP Morgan that just paid 920 million for spoofing gold and silver on hundreds of thousands of occasions. Uh, CFTC's words, not mine. Do I have that? Well, I don't have that one pulled up. You can take my word for it, hopefully, or check it out for your, even better. No, don't do that. Google it for yourself. The recent press release from the CFTC on that one, but JP Morgan, the Department of Justice described as a criminal enterprise is the custodian of SLV. Now I have this uh, little formula I've developed in later years that seems to have served me well, where, I mean, if you just hang out with people that are good people, they're always, you know, they treat you like family, they really want your best interest as well, you usually get one kind of result. When you hang out with criminals, I don't know, maybe the metal's there, maybe it's not there, maybe they stick some fee at the end or, that's the thing. I mean, look, look at what happened. I'm hearing stories of people even that were not margin that owned shares in GameStop and Robinhood that they just sold their shares out, which that's, uh, 
I'm not sure. I this is what I've heard. I can't confirm that. Obviously, there's a lot happening quickly here. So, um, but I mean, that's like even one upping John Corzine when he just traded their money. Um, or it's at least on that level. I don't know if that tops Corzine, but we'll stay on track here today. Um, but I mean, you know, like if, if, if Robin Hood, Hood does that, I don't know what JP Morgan as the custodian does, but I don't have any interest in finding out with my money. But again, to put that spike in perspective, see last week we had this 20 burger there and that was a really big one historically. You had to go back a couple of years to find anything in that territory. Here's the two year and you can see that spike of 20, the highest in two years right up there. And then let's go five years back. Um, that 20 spike, still the highest, 10 years. Uh, okay. If we go back 10 years in 2013, there was one bigger one. Um, but still this 35 million ounce deposit yesterday. So uh, perhaps let me put this in as clear words as possible. After one day of this movement, movement, uh, whatever you call it, the impact was record setting. So I had that call yesterday. Some of you may have seen with Dave Pranzler where, you know, and I usually takes one side of these things and I take the others, which is fine. And I think that's great to, because it's not a matter of a right or wrong, but having the discussion, looking at the different perspectives, then you decide. And I think investing always works a lot better when you figure out what makes sense to you and you own your own decisions. So by all means, this is not legal financial advice. I'm sharing my research and what I'm looking at, some things, some data points I think people should be aware of. But, um, you know, again, we had that conversation yesterday. Is Does this have the potential? Is it even conceivable? Because while I don't know the history of how long people, I guess there was a guy named Roaring Kitty that's been following GameStop in that situation for a while. I don't know how long this goes back. But silver, I've been researching the, the manipulation element specifically for a decade. Um, Ted Butler for uh, Bill Murphy, Chris Powell, even decades before that. In Doug Casey's uh, 1979 book, Crisis Investing, he concludes his chapter on silver with the sentence that any analysis of the silver market must start with this manipulation that he had just spent a couple pages describing. So... It goes back for a while, especially you've had QE4, QE5, QE100, whatever you call unlimited QE, all these wild things happening over the past decade when people uh, probably would be turning to silver the most, hasn't made a dent in the price. And then yesterday comes along and you get 37 million ounces added. So... What we're looking at here, this is the transparent silver holdings. Again, this is the great Nick Laird's gold charts are us. Um, you have to pay about 200 bucks a year, I think, for this. Although, credible site. I'm a subscriber, so uh, thank you, Nick, for getting us all this great data that I didn't even know was out there for a long time. But um, anyway, uh, what you see here. So this is SLV, PSLV. <laughs> Deutsche Bank, maybe we'll pull that up to today. Um, Cause Deutsche Bank, wait till you hear these guys. Oh, wow, look, when you type that in, I come up first. Uh, I wonder, <laughs> I hope this is, uh, this might be, oh good, we still have it. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to Deutsche Bank. These guys didn't learn See, when I was trading equity options back on the American Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange, we had this guy named Mike. I'll leave his, his last name uh, uh, aside for now. But it was the compliance guy. And he would often say that two out of every three things I type and send are read by a regulator or compliance officer, whether external or internal. So I was always kind of careful. I mean, you know, if you had like a bad date the night before you drank too much and did something, you know, it's like, A, you know, maybe you don't want your company to know it. B, you probably don't want regulators to know it. Although apparently, as you see here, uh, UBS trader wrote, going to bend this silver lower. Um, <laughs> Avalanche can be triggered by a pebble if you get the timing right. 
And I think another thing that's special, since you see Deutsche Bank, UBS, uh, perhaps a lawyer can comment if that gets us to collusion. Um, but these guys didn't get that memo not to uh, broadcast and leave a bread of uh, trail of breadcrumbs behind. So back to our chart here. What this is showing is the blue line, that's the amount of metal in these trusts. And it's interesting because here you have the gray line, that's the silver price. So all the while, while silver was coming down from 50 bucks in 2011, here's the price getting destroyed, yet silver constantly going into the trust, constantly going into the trust. Then you see this heavy area here was what happened last year following COVID. And again, leading back to what we saw yesterday where you got this one that here's 10 years back, 35 is up there. So I think in there, there's one in, uh, if you go to the long term here, yeah, there's something, I'm not sure. I think that must have been when Warren Buffett would have started the SLV trust. I'll keep an eye on that. I'm not sure what that one is for. But aside from that one week in uh, 1998, let's call it, in the uh, so otherwise, or at least in the history of SLV, yesterday was a record. So to the question that I debated with Dave yesterday, does what's happening now have the ability to make an impact in the silver manipulation? You're darn right it does. It already did. Um, and to put that in context, let's, uh, let's take a look here. Um, so here is from the Silver Institute, their supply and demand. Now, there's, there's a lot of different ways you can calculate something. I talked, uh, I mentioned last night that, you know, there's about a uh, 900 million ounces mined in a normal year. That's the mine production you see in the top line there. Uh, and then there's some recycling. Looks like, again, I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of guesstimating here. You know, nobody knows where every piece of silver is. There's not like a microchip in it. But you can see it's on average about a billion ounces. That's a million ounces. So when you see the, that billion, get what I'm saying. All right. So here's 978 million. Um, so I was thinking, you know, 37, we'll, do, we'll, we'll round things to make it simple. Yesterday when I thought the number was 37, turns out to be 34, even better. So 34 times three is 102. So Basically, if you did, if you if you repeated what happened on Friday, this Monday and this Tuesday, which I don't know if that will happen, but just to show the pace, that's 100 million ounces in three days. So basically, if you did that over 30 days at that pace would take the entire year's supply of metal, <clears throat> which is stunning in its own right. But Today I was calling my mom, uh, I guess my first client at Arcadia, who Ma believed in me way back when in 2011 when I was trading this and after I burned that first $20,000 in her option account uh, when JP Morgan was spoofing it up back then. Although Ma stuck with it because, and I think this is the same for a lot of people who get into this, um, you know, by all means, I not, uh, go around saying my opinion is right, someone else can't. But I mean, I've, I've approached this the way I approach any investment. I like learning from others, see if I'm missing something. I love getting more information than making my view, seeing what seems right. And I don't know how anyone can <laughs> dispute any of these things. And no one's disputed what I've written in that book, The Big Silver Short. I mean, there's not someone who comes along. I mean, I get people who say they think the manipulation is never going to end. But I don't have anyone who's said, Chris, hey, this is what you're missing here. By all means, if anybody watching is, is finding something that I can't see or that none of the guests or the hundreds of analysts or mining executives I've talked to can find, by all means, please let me know. I don't have, you know, any like wake up with some agenda to talk about silver manipulation in my adult life, but you know, I was sitting on the trading floor in 2011 after the prices got smashed and, you know, I felt I had a good background. I understood, you know, and I think it's helpful when you're actually trading in that environment 
you know, it's different than trading at home. I mean, when you're actually around these characters all day and you see the different personality types and see, so that was helpful for me. And <clears throat> following Silver, this just never added up. <laughs> Turns out there's a reason why. And anyway, so I was calling Ma this morning. I thought it'd be interesting. You know, she doesn't spend all of her waking hours looking at silver charts like I do. So I was thinking, all right, she's, you know, she talked to me about it. I talked to her the other day for a little bit. You know, I want to get out, like to get a view outside of my own fishbowl. I'm looking at this stuff all day. I was wondering, I wonder what Ma's heard about this. So <clears throat> I called her this morning, was explaining some of the basics of what was happening, what I saw going on. And she had heard of it. I asked her if any, if she, any of her friends had mentioned it yet. Again, she's like a 75 year old woman, not on a trading floor. So um, was not, didn't come up in her conversations for whatever that's worth. But what was interesting was that I was, as I was trying to put it into context to her, I thought of rather than saying, well, you know, at 33, 34 million ounces a day, that would eat up the entire mine supply, which is true, yet maybe there's a better way to phrase this because that's fine if you uh, or if no one's going to use electronics next year. I mean, that's fine if we're going to cancel all the solar panels. We're going to halt all production on that. If they're going to cancel the green agenda, but Biden's everything green done. All the electric cars are going to stop. If you're going to cancel that, then okay. Then I guess you could go 30 days. But here's the thing: is that all right? Let's let's call it a, a billion ounces. Well, just to make the math easy, most of the silver, and this is what I think a lot of people new to metals may not have heard, so it's worth pointing out again, most of the silver gets consumed. And uh, another thing that I'm guessing a lot of people might not have heard, now again, is, you know, no one knows exactly how many pieces of silver there are out there, but at least there's a consensus, I would say, among the different data sources, the different analysts that... There's about two to four billion ounces of silver above ground in investment grade form. So that's two billion, two to four billion ounces. So at say twenty-five dollars an ounce, that means the value of you know the the investment grade form, which would be the bars in the Comex, the bars in these silver trusts. Um, you know, I guess, depending on how you're doing the calculations, some people might throw, you can look at the Silver Eagle sales. There's not like a, a whole ton of different buckets out there. I may be missing one right now, but um, anyway, so there's two to 4 billion ounces of silver by most Greek consensus estimates versus gold is usually placed at around 6 billion ounces. So if you're saying, wait a second, I thought silver is more plentiful in the Earth's crust and comes out at 10 or 15 to 1, you would be correct. But the majority of silver is consumed. Here you can see of that 1 billion, 510, 511 went into industrial, 33 into uh, photography. There's your jewelry. There's your silverware. So all of the, I'm assuming they the way they break this down that all the, the silver in electronics, laptops, uh, your refrigerator, your cell phone would be here. But in either case, you add this together, unfortunately, to make it uh, a little easier to see, we'll go over here, because I put it into a spreadsheet for everyone, because I'm a little bit of a uh, former math nerd, but uh, these are the things that we do. So again, I don't know if someone really has an issue with the, the way I calculated this or the percentage. Okay, bear with me. There's, there's a variety of different ways to calculate it. But in terms of, if you look at this field here, that 120, um, well, we'll come back to that. Uh, yeah, well, let's take a look at that. So that 120, this is net investment in, in ETPs, which is exchange traded products, which is basically my understanding is they're defining this as the silver trust. So that's saying last year when you had a record year, you had 120 million ounces went into those exchange traded products. 
And yesterday, SLV reported 34 million ounces in one day, the day after this uh, short squeeze busting action spread to silver, which I think is fantastic. Again, uh, I uh, want to issue a quick disclaimer here because by all means, understand there's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of things that some people think are fair, some people think aren't fair. I advocate people to do things that are legal. Don't do anything illegal. Um, even if the other side is doing something illegal, then you just kind of make it easier for them to win. And so, you know, I would just say congratulations to everyone that's been following this and watching this because you're making an impact. So I'm going to be try, try to be very careful. Actually, I don't have to be careful. I, I don't <laughs> sitting here telling anyone who would listen that there was a short squeeze. So if the government thinks there's a issue with that, then <laughs> good. I'll, 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 I'd be happy to share my issues with government regulation and illegal things they do as well. So, uh, but anyway, one thing I would just, I can't tell anybody else what to do, but I would say, suggest uh, keep whatever way you respond legal because uh, there's a bunch of good signs around this that we will cover. Um, but again, just to finish up here, so this was last year and that's how you get that percentage. But part of the reason, I mean, I don't know, is there a better way to calculate this? Possibly, but the main point is that you see, that's what I put in my spreadsheet. So if we have, uh, all right. So we'll look at industrial photography, jewelry and silverware in 2019 was 806 million ounces. In 2020, these are forecasted numbers, was 748 million ounces. Um, in 2018, I'm looking at this total down here, 814 million ounces, 2017, 806. So basically you're getting about 800 million ounces, We're down a little bit last year. But you're getting 800 million ounces going into industry. And for anyone who's wondering, well, what are these industrial users thinking? I mean, people have been, myself included, wondering for years if at some point they're like, wait a second, this doesn't add up because Apple needs silver or else they don't make their products. And what's interesting is that most of the time when silver is in something, it's like a dollar's worth of silver. I've Googled uh, how much in a cell phone. I think they said 0.35 grams um which is a small amount an ounce 28 uh grams in an ounce three so that's about an eighth of that's 0.3 oh that's 0.35 of one gram so maybe three to one gram then times 28 so maybe 84 ish one i don't know <laughs> someone else can help me with the math there but it's a small amount so if you have like a a dollar of silver in there and the silver price triples, you know, they're going to pay three bucks. You know, it's not, you know, if you're selling a $500 product, one of your costs goes from $1 to $3. So, A, there's certainly, and people like Ted Butler's talked about this, where this wild turnover that we see in the COMEX, it was just like metal always going back and forth in one vault, out another vault of, uh, he talks about the turnover there. He mentioned Spoke about that at Silverfest last year. Um, so uh, Keith Newmeyer has mentioned that when he asks some of these guys where they get the silver, how much they actually use, that they don't seem to have any interest in discussing that. Um, anyway, I mean, I don't think, you know, it's either like we, like Rick Rule would say about the uh, uranium price, either we stop using electricity as a society or the price is going to have to rise. Similar here. Um, you know, I mean, okay, it was down 50 uh, million ounces last year. So there's some change, but all right. In either case, they're going for their majority of the pie. And last year, now here's 216. That's new physical demand. So that's people that call places like Miles Franklin or other physical dealers and buy physical metal. And by the way, uh, 
people are looking for a safe place to buy or sell physical metal, I do have a partnership with Miles Franklin. You can find out any questions or things regarding physical silver, email Arcadia at Miles Franklin. Um, but that's, that's when you hear people actually buying a physical piece of metal, not SLV shares, not a mining stock, but something you can hold in your hand, which, you know, and there's some people who say, if you don't hold it, if you don't own it, which I think there's a lot of value to that statement because yeah, there's some, you know, I wouldn't put it in the JP Morgan vault and expect to get it back. At the same time, if you have $10 million of silver, do you want to like stick it in your basement? Um, you want to stack like Chris? <laughs> Yeah, that's a picture. Not not basement doesn't look like that yet. One day, um, so I mean, if you have you know uh, ten million dollars of silver and you do have a YouTube channel, maybe you wouldn't want to leave it all in one place. So, but in either case, this is actual physical purchases. And I might add, uh, Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin. I recorded a call with him on Wednesday, which appears every Saturday night. So that way people can hear directly from one of the physical dealers. I know a lot of people say, hey, well, we see the COMEX price. We can look that up anytime. How do you find out what's going on in the physical market? Well, that's coming later, I believe at 9 p.m. Central. So great reason to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. So you hear what Andy had to say, but everything that from my partner who processes our silver sales, I mean, it's been getting bigger, not less. So, you know, I thought the best way to calculate, you know, really consistent terms, I mean, yeah, you could take that 34 million as a percent of, percent of total supply, but it's hard to see that going down. This number doesn't seem to be going down. And this is kind of what's left over. And then on top of all of that, you see, here's last year, negative 50 million ounce deficit. Here is the, the projected numbers, which are still coming in for 2020, saying negative 105. I thought I had seen them put out a report earlier this year where they had projected that at negative 318. I don't know, maybe the new numbers are in, but in either case, you see already a market with a deficit. And I've been studying this for 10 years. I can't figure out where that comes from. Nobody I know. And I mean, I, again, written a book about this. I hosted a conference called Silver Fest where, you know, anyone out there is writing a newsletter or talking about silver, you know, was there. Nobody else can seem to figure that out. So again, what is really the takeaway, the point of all of this is that for people wondering and I don't know, was it the people inside that forum that bought the medal or were it peop was it people that... For example, we're reading the Wall Street Journal, which I didn't even know these guys could spell silver, but this is kind of what I've been getting at and thinking about all week that wh whoever it is individually, now you have, it's, it's become a national story. I mean, it's kind of like Occupy Wall Street was a big story, whether it's, the, it, you know, okay, it started with GameStop and the other stocks that uh, have been squeezed, but now... All right, let's, we'll try this. We'll look at the commodities section. And before yesterday, I'm guessing we won't be able to find a article about silver. It's interesting there, uh, commodities. I, I remember looking a little while ago, where is their news feed? Uh, is, and it's like, sometimes they have one or two stories a week. So here, the 28th, they talk about silver. Before that, they had a story about oil on the 21st and the 22nd and the 21st. So A, that, I mean, and for anyone else who's new to this, in my days on Wall Street, I found when you talk about gold and silver, it's not the way to make friends, definitely not the way to increase your bonus. Um, so, I mean, this is the kind of add-on effect that you get, though. Once something is a media event, and uh, let's take a look at some of the other headlines here. Uh, let's go over here. Here is Zero Hedge. Reddit preparing to unleash the world's biggest short squeeze in silver. 
All right, everybody, let's Google that one and tweet that one out at home. Come on, let the world know. Uh, and by all means, I guess the reason I feel comfortable saying this legally, you don't have to like encourage anyone. I would just, the only thing I would encourage people to do is be aware of the truth. By all means, don't invest anything because of anything that I say. Double check this, verify it, talk with other experts. Um, you'll probably find a lot of people who will say, well, that's all conspiracy theory. Um, and that's fine, but find a way that they can dispute any of the evidence that's put out here. I'll let you, uh, I'll pull the title back up here. So Reddit preparing to unleash world's biggest short squeeze in silver. Keep in mind though that <laughs> I didn't make this up, these, these transcripts. Uh, let's see, bro, let's make a slight adjustment to our plan today to which a collusionary Deutsche Bank trader re responded K. Um, and there, trust me, there was more than this. Uh, if you want to accelerate it, go short 20K silver, stay on offering, you know. So uh, in fact, well, I got a little treat for you. Mm, which one to go to first? Uh, there's a couple more glorious headlines that I'd like to cover here today, but let's do this one. Because again, I can understand uh, you're saying, all right, you know, this couldn't really be happening. The regulators would have done something. But actually, I can answer that one for you because I was fortunate to interview Bart Chilton shortly before his passing. Bart was a commissioner at the CFTC uh, during the years, uh, I think until 2014. And now that, again, just so no one thinks I am making this one up. <laughs> Because I can understand. And, and in all seriousness, by all means, I encourage people don't just take because I know there are people out there that say things that they're not genuinely believing or do not genuinely uh, subscribe to, but they put out for diff different reasons. So that's why I encourage scrutiny of uh, anything I say or do. And um, you know, so but I mean, here you go, JP Morgan to pay 920 million. That's uh, for manipulation of global markets for treasuries, uh, treasuries and precious metals, uh, metals and treasuries. Yes, keep in mind they were manipulating the treasury market too. So let's give them full credit. Um, but yeah, back here, just another piece of evidence. This is the guy that I emailed in 2011, the commissioners of the CFTC, there were five of them. Bart mentions how most of them started blocking emails of people submitting the evidence. And now, decade later, Department of Justice find, found hundreds of thousands of occasions of spoofing in their own words, not mine. Um, but Bart actually did write back in 2011. He said, I know what you're talking about. And he basically said, you can check my comments where he talked about manipulation. He talked about the evidence he saw. And fortunately, I, in fact, I never thought he would agree to an interview, but this was for part of the book, The Big Silver Short. And I think this would be uh, helpful, especially anyone who hasn't seen this before, even if you have seen it. So we'll play this clip here. Again, former commissioner who presided over the CFTC's investigation into silver manipulation. And let's hear what Bart had to say. Well, there's some stuff that's out there in the public that I'm not sure everybody, you know, put together. Um, most people did. I would never, for example, and I won't now, um, say that, um, you know, there was uh, a bank and name it that held, uh, you know, close to 40 percent of the silver market at one point. Um, but the news reports, I mean, people surmise it's J.P. Morgan Chase, and the news reports uh, in the public record showed that when Bear Stearns collapsed, that their silver positions got transferred over to J.P. Morgan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, the CFTC, had to approve those positions because they, those positions, the layman positions, uh, I'm sorry, the Bear Stearns positions, uh, the Bear Stearns positions, when they came over, combined with JP's positions, were so large that they violated the position limits 
on which one trader could hold. So the CFTC had to approve that JP could take on the bear silver positions. So people want to do the math, they can do the math on who had the largest silver. Um, but there was an exception there that we made, and that's in the public record. Uh, what's not really uh, looked at too much is that we made that uh, uh, allowance for a time certain, and I forget exactly how long it was, but it was not years. It was you know months. Maybe it was three months or six months or maybe it was nine months. I think it was probably six, but I, I don't recall. Um, and that allowance was for them to uh, be able to get out of those positions. Right. Well, one thing we didn't know right at first is that there was a uh, – the head silver trader for Bear, uh, he went with the silver positions to JP, and so he's trading at JP. And after this time was coming to an end, the, 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 the runway which we had given for them to get out of the positions in excess of position limits, they were nowhere close to getting out of them. Matter of fact, at one point, they'd bought even more. Right. Which was like direct, you know, conflict to what we had in mind, um, and so they were granted a little bit more time, a couple of months, as I recall, and they did ultimately get down to the, the position. But it was at that time that I, when they were so large, that I made the, the comment about how large a particular bank was uh, in the market, which sort of shocked people, and it shocked me, quite frankly, that it was so large. So. Uh, anyway, these were uh, uh, sort of troubling times, and um, a lot of this uh, was going on then, the, the uh, accused uh, manipulation, and uh, it was a, a really uh, time-certain period at which uh, our investigators were, were looking at market participants, including uh, those at uh, that institution. Um, they had such large positions to ensure that uh, everything was okay. And the bottom line is we found a lot of things that indicated things were not okay. So I might add the whole interview is definitely <laughs> worth listening to. If you go to Arcadia Economics, Bart Shilton, it's kind of funny. I still remember the day I was talking with him because going into it, I didn't know if the guy would be able to say anything. And it's a couple minutes in, he just started unleashing some stuff where I was like, just, just sit there, let him talk. Uh, anyway, you can see his a 45 minute interview. You can find the whole thing there. Uh, one thing that he talked about that I would like to point out you mentioned how when the, the positions came over from Bear Stearns, JP Morgan took over on the Ides of March weekend in 2008, which I'm sure is just a coincidence, similar to how the Fed went to Unlimited or started QE again on that same weekend, 2020. We'll leave that aside for now, though, because if we look at what happened in March of 2008, it's quite fascinating. Um, because that is when Bear Stearns failed and JP Morgan took them over. And we'll pull up a few charts here. I think this will be interesting for you. Because again, remember 2007, mortgages started failing. Uh, Fed was printing money like a drunken sailor, um, cutting interest rates. They cut two and a half, 250 basis points in six months. It's the same amount it took them uh, nine years following QE2 to raise it, and it started imploding the whole thing. Um, so here you see, actually, let's go back a little bit and get, uh, okay, we'll go back to 2007. Okay, because September is where that rally begins as the Fed is printing away. So here you see September of 2007, uh, silver is 12 bucks. Who would want a silly little rock door stopper? There it is, uh, October, floating around 12, 13, $14. Okay, and now I'll, I'll say that, see a lot of people remember Lehman Brothers. 
uh, in September of 2008. Although for people working in the financial industry, I'm sure they remember things were wild quite well before then. Because I remember the end of that year when I was trading options, you know, you'd sit there all day in your P&L, you'd think you made this or that. And then the market would just be up or down 500 points in the last hour. So it was quite wild. And there you see silver start to climb from 1375 moves quite quickly then up here's february uh i guess i missed january but it goes up from 14 to 17 over january then up to 19. then now keep in mind there's these comex contracts on some level or maybe they're not maybe even the comex but if they acknowledge at least if they were honest and said hey hey this is a derivative that has no connection to silver but people are expecting it to have some correlation to physical silver demand. And now as someone who's studied silver, has a partnership with a silver dealership, as knows people who buy silver, who, people who buy large amounts of silver. I mean, the main things is when the system looks like it's about to crack or the Fed's printing money, which keep in mind now, here we come to the weekend of the Bear Stearns. Here's Friday at the close. Fed says they're gonna take it over Monday, or Sunday, we get JP Morgan's buying it for, I think it was a dollar, two dollars a share. And then I might add the Fed cut interest rates, I believe it was 75 basis points that Monday. Yet in the middle of that, look at silver dropping like a rock. I mean, <coughs> you really couldn't make this up. Then there it is, more money printing. Uh, climbs back up to $18 over May. But here, there's a June, uh, <coughs> kind of choppy, but your July, it gets back up to $19. And then, well, things are getting so bad that now Lehman Brothers is failing. <clears throat> Here's silver falling to $10. And how this ties back to what Bart said, remember he said that the combined position was over the allowed limit. <clears throat> And he gave them a waiver to make it smaller. And of course, what did JP Morgan come back and do? They made it bigger. And he was furious, understandably so, especially because during that exact time when they're making their position bigger, which I believe, and there's a large consensus agreement I, that they were very short, they made it bigger. And I guess the smoking gun to me is that you had physical dealers like, such as Miles Franklin and others could not get product. People were trying to buy silver. The mints were closed down. I think it was around September or October. This is in the book, The Big Silver Short. Uh, you can also Google it online. <clears throat> you couldn't get silver. He, Andy of Miles Franklin couldn't find it in Europe. None of the distributors had silver. Um, to the point he thought he was going to go out of business because he had no product to sell. Finally, the U.S. Mint comes back online. And while silver here, actually, it even went down further to $9. So in the middle of when people want it the most. And when J.P. Morgan is increasing their position, you know, and <laughs> I'm sure un unconnected. But you have it. So when something goes down in price, that means supply is overwhelming demand yet. You couldn't find it just went down over 50%, shouldn't be like flooded everywhere. It's something nobody wants. Um, but to me, that was the smoking gun, really seeing the impact of how distortive these banks have been to the price. Um, and then of course, you know, you can look at here is, uh, we'll pull up one more. I'm gonna wrap, keep this one to under an hour because good news, uh, we will have, going to be doing a live q a later tonight specifically for anyone following this uh anyone in the reddit group or other way otherwise um again today uh, i thought it would be helpful to go through some of these but i think it will be 9 p.m central 10 p.m eastern we'll do it that will be a q a i won't be uh going through stuff specifically just to uh answer any questions that can be helpful to people uh and I, I'd be, to be completely forthright, yes, I am heavily invested in silver. I've been doing so for years. So, um, but I don't know why you, as a man who wants to be considered honorable, you can hold me to my commitment to give genuine uh, 
I don't, I'm not telling anybody what to do. I'm just sharing some of the background that I don't think Wall Street will tell you about that I personally, and I think several thousand people who watch the show on a nightly basis have expressed as helpful. Um, here's just about 10 years ago, actually amazing thinking about how we're almost in February of 2021, because February of 2011 was when things were, or even January, we were starting to skyrocket. And here, as many silver investors who were following it back then, see silver climbing to 50 bucks as QE2 is raging. And then in the middle of the night, well, let, me, let me pull up the actual chart. It's just so special. You're going to want to have seen this one in case you haven't. If you remember this day clearly, maybe you didn't want to see this one. I thought, let's put it like this. So the red line, April 29th, that's when silver is up at $49. Um, when Ben Bernanke started QE2, again, I'd been trading options for, uh, I guess about five years by then been studying gold and silver for two years. So I was ready and I was fortunate at least on the way up to have large GLD and SLV call option positions on. Um, so I thought it was like close to being set for a long time here. And then this became the beginning of the popping of at least that dream which is the funny way life works out. Although I wouldn't trade it for a second because how exciting uh, to be following this with all of you here today. And I mean, I'll put it like this, you know, throughout the years, I think every silver investor has learned that just when you think they can't drag it out longer, you find out that they can. So can I come here conclusively and say, hey, this is the end, you know, watch out on Monday. I don't know that for sure. I mean, it's not written, but just as I'm following along what's happening uh, and seeing the way this story is spreading and then knowing how intriguing it is, how many layers there are. And I find that once people find out about this, they don't unknow it. So I am really darn intrigued. Uh, and a few last things I'd like to cover before we wrap up. So we'll close those out, close that one out. Um, here's the volume. And I remember after seeing the fireworks on Thursday, I was thinking, gee, I'll bet there's massive volume on this one. And you can see the blue. We'll leave the options aside. This is where some of the banks confess to selling a lot of call and put options on the COMEX futures and then screwing their customers by hammering the price right to the strike. So people who made a bet get cheated by their banker. Again, this is the confessions of JP Morgan traders, not my words, can uh, welcome to look that up in their letters to the Department of Justice. But we'll leave the options aside because you see here, 205,000 contracts traded, 202,000. Let's round it to 200,000 at 5,000 ounces per contract. That means on Thursday, two, uh, 1 billion ounces of silver were traded. If you remember earlier, that's the total mine supply. So they're trading the annual, or no, that's the total, including recycling too. They trade the, the annual total amount of silver on the COMEX on a daily basis now. God only knows what will happen on Monday. So wanted to point that out. Um, here's an interesting one. Uh, some of you may have seen Andrew McGuire um, and by the way, one last thing about those options, watch out for COMEX options expiration was last Tuesday, common day where the price is rigged prior to that, um, which I have started studying more actively. And we are going to be beginning an option group consulting program. So we do have some option traders out there and, um, we're going to do one more call similar to the one we did two weeks ago. Uh, if anyone was on that, we'll be doing that tomorrow night. And by our Q&A tonight, I will have the link. Yara, if you're watching, perhaps maybe uh, that link for the last one we did is still valid if anyone would like to sign up to that. Now, there's a lot of people in this short squeeze trading options. And um, maybe before we wrap up, I'll give my thoughts on if I had a billion dollars and wanted to force the short squeeze, how would I technically execute that? Um, but anyway, 
there's 12 hours. If you look at a 12 hour, let's say a 12 hour work day and 60 minutes, there's 720 minutes in the day. So this score more here. Thank you very much. I love this one last night. So if you have, uh, if you do, if you look at in terms of thousand ounce bars, 37 million ounces, okay, it ended up being 34, but math will be close. So there would be 37,000 1,000 ounce bars. So divided by 720 means 51.39. So it's interesting thinking if that much was deposited into SLV in one day, so they're taking the serial number, recording, et cetera, a little over 51 heavy 1,000 ounce bars per minute using a 12 hour day. So this is one of the reasons why now, I mean, even if you had known that was coming in advance, that seems like you'd need a heavy staff to do that. So did 34 million ounces really get added to the SLV trust? I know some people think that's physically impossible. I don't know. Maybe you can just like take the pallet over there. I, I don't know how that's going. Uh, in terms of other surprises we have planned, we are going to have a silver industry response to this tomorrow where a lot of the guests uh, that I'm fortunate to have on my show, uh, I'm hoping to round up a bunch of them, the leaders of the silver industry to comment and share some of their thoughts. So we're gonna make tomorrow the, the Super Bowl of silver here on the Arcadia Network. So hit the subscribe button, the notification bell, if you're following this story, I think you will enjoy what is coming your way. So anyway, um, that's a lot of silver added. Is the silver really in the trust? That's the question a lot of people have. I hope so. Uh, reasons I, I mean, JP Morgan's the custodian. They don't inspire me with confidence. And that's why when I hear uh, one comment, if I may pass along to the folks in the Reddit group, when I hear the discussion and I've started looking through there, um, I'd like to start sharing some thoughts in there and just uh, only so many minutes in the day. And I probably should get some sleep soon. But uh, that aside, in terms of, I, I don't know that buying SLV shares would be the way that I would go because if there's some sort of fracture, which I think is inevitable, but let's say it happens next week, for example, SLV would seem to be one of the places where people would have a great risk because let's say SLV turns out to be a fraud and, uh, and there's, the metal isn't there. I mean, you'll, be, you'll have a, a great argument but I don't want to be sitting in court hoping a bankrupt entity run by JP Morgan pays me one day, not run by JP Morgan, where JP Morgan is the custodian. Now, on the other hand, let's say I had a billion dollars to play with. I think what I would do then, if, uh, let's see the SLV prospectus, if we can find this real quick. I think you have to execute, you, I think there is a delivery mechanism. It's not like anybody can just call up and ask for their silver. I think there has to be an authorized participant, which I forget exactly what that means, but um, let's see if we can find the redemption feature here. I believe it is in 50,000 ounce lots. All right, let's look at the prospectus. I've actually gone through this, it's real, <laughs> real blast to read, okay. The trust intends to issue shares on a continuous basis. Trust issues and reduce shares only in blocks of 50,000 or multiples thereof as a basket. Take place in exchange for silver. Only registered broker dealers that become authorized participants by entering into a contract may purchase or redeem <coughs> baskets. Um, all right. So theoretically, what they're doing is that when they added those 34 million shares yesterday, they're supposed to add 34 million ounces, one ounce per share. Does that happen? Uh, we may be close to finding out. Um, just trying to genuinely share my honest view on the matter. Uh, I, I hope that it's there. I, would, I think it's going to be a shame if a lot of people are using that to protect themselves and it's not. But I would say at the least... 
<clears throat> it is a risk that is hedgeable. This is why if you really don't want to hold it at your house, get the Sprott Trust. You know, a lot of the, uh, again, I'm, I'm biased towards Miles Franklin. They have storage options. There are other good places. Goldsilver.com run by Mike Maloney. That's Jeff Clark. Uh, probably read his articles. I'd feel safe putting it there. Uh, AppMax, by the way, I got a text here that someone is saying AppMax is almost out of some silver products. So we can take a look at that. But um, again, like AppMax or one of these places that at least has a long track record and people know it. Um, JP Morgan has a long track record there too and people know it. It's just not such a good one. Um, so I'm going to be careful with how I'm phrasing things because just in this picture I have, it says that Let's see, uh, Yaren, perhaps uh, in the chat, my partner here at Arcadia, you could type any details you have, but 100 ounce silver bar secondary market available February 18th. Um, they're saying from AppMax, let's see if we can silver bars by weight. So 100 ounce silver bars let's take a look see what we find there um i mean really if uh okay available february 18th so pre-sale so it looks like some are in some are not um but again if there if you if you're sitting there and say you think there's a short squeeze and you want to know what you can do i mean i would say physical the options are great if you want to make a profit. I don't know that that's as direct of a way to force a short squeeze. Um, but I mean, basically, the way I've always thought this has to end is when enough people show up for their physical metal. And then you basically you reach that point where someone can't deliver, which, again, as we covered uh, throughout this call, at that current pace, and nobody knows where the break point is, I would say it's felt... Like it has to be closed for a while. And then you had last year where people were buying tons of physical silver. Uh, we'll see. Um, but it, I'm quite intrigued to see what the open looks like uh, 6 p.m. Eastern on Sunday night. And then, of course, what the open and the markets looks like on Monday morning, especially with First Majestic Silver. Uh, talked about that more yesterday. We'll be happy to take questions on that tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern. A uh, few more, and then we're going to wrap up for now. But obviously, you know, I'm reading this one, Reddit, preparing to unleash world's biggest short squeeze in silver. And then you have this, is a silver short squeeze possible? How can you not click on that? I didn't even get a chance to read this one yet. Oh, great, though. It's by James Anderson of SD Bullion. James has a fantastic YouTube channel, SD Bullion, uh, where you can get plenty more. Uh, and there's one of his videos. What did James? Ooh, I will look at that one later. Interesting. Uh, one quick note. I had wondered if it's at least conceivable that there could be some political influence behind this. And we'll call this in the complete rumor mill that you'd be a fool to listen to what I'm saying right now because it's only someone who's crazy would do that. Although apparently, and I did see Donald Trump Jr. tweeted out that, who does this look like? And at the same time, there is at least speculation that the Robin Hood founder was basically given an order, was called from the White House and said to basically do what he did with saying you can't buy. Again, these, these are things that are going around there. I was not in the room. I don't know if they are true or not. I've heard them. And I'm just factoring that in and would encourage you to do the same. Um, assume it's not true. And who knows? But it's interesting that Donald Trump Jr. tweeted out that, who does this look like? And um, still no word from Trump, which I find just, you know, I'm sure there's nothing to that. I'm sure it's normal. Oh, okay. We got, uh, we got two left. These ones are important. So. 
Um, first of all, here, <clears throat> you may have seen this last night. First Majestic uh, was limited in some brokerages that you can only buy one share. Now, I don't know if we just officially adopted Marxism as the new form of government last night. I guess you can't rule that out in today's environment, but uh, let's see, is this, uh, uh, to come in recent trading. Okay. That's not, uh, I don't see the article for, but they were on that list of, uh, places where you could only buy one share, which on one hand, uh, you know, I can understand certainly, and I'm a lot of good friends there at first majestic certainly could be frustrating yet. I will say, keep the faith for this reason is that anytime you try and distort markets or, or, or governments try and like ration things. It's like when you tell your dog not to eat that steak. He's going to want to eat it, whether you tell him or you yell at him or whatever. And usually what rationing does, uh, and by the way, this is a great example. You can look back to how we came off the gold standard following the collapse of the London gold pool in the late 60s because they, they, they tried to do stuff like that. Then Nixon puts us on price controls, distorts things. The blowback is always bigger. You saw it this week with AMC and uh, GameStop where they, they limited the buys, they screwed their, uh, or maybe were forced to screw their customers uh, or I'll try and be careful with my language. It just is uh, not good for their customers. But then, the blowback overwhelmed it. I'm still not sure exactly where that was changed or removed, but, and I think it was just like they were, they were targeting that one share per person in retail accounts, which means probably institutions can still buy it. And I don't know. It just reminds me an awful lot of in like in hockey, when you pull the goalie, it's a desperation move that, you know, when your back's against the corner, Maybe you don't have any other play because that's your last chance to win. And But if it doesn't work, so when I saw that one share of First Majestic, and what, what is the free market rationalization for that? Where, 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 where was the, all the call for regulation when First Majestic was getting shorted and Keith Newmeyer had the courage to speak up and talk about how these banks have been committing a felony that's clear as day. You just heard one of the regulators talk about how the whole agency was a fraud. But that's fine because the best part, I know there's been people who are frustrated and it's been a long wait. But keep in mind, the longer it's delayed, the more leverage you have to hammer on to keep this Ponzi scheme going. That's why the upside... I mean, if you have a true failure on the COMEX or a true short squeeze, this is not going to stop at $50. Or I don't know, maybe it goes in stages. I, but I don't think that that will be like, oh, all right, it'll go to 50 and then equilibrium will resume. So I, I, would, I would encourage all, all regulatory agencies, make more rules, try and distort it more to fit it back into the unnatural position you're aiming for the first time. Please do that because the more government does this, the more attention it's going to bring and the farther it's going to snap back and the sooner I personally believe it will happen. Again, none of this is legal financial advice, just the thoughts of a former option trader. But one last one and then we're going to wrap up here. Um, oh, and we have a message from... Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin, premiums have shot up. So we're seeing an increase in premiums. Uh, and uh, again, I'm guessing we might be able to get Andy to join me for a bit on that live Q&A. Rob Keats, silver genius from goldsilverpros.com is actually staying down the street right now. So I believe he'll be in-house live along with Nibbles the Silver Dog covering uh, and again to everyone in the forum or otherwise if you have any questions about this tonight 10 p.m eastern we are going to have a live q a right back here on this channel so hit the subscribe button and notification bell so as soon as that is available you'll be able to take part in that ask any questions i'll stay around for a while tonight um but anyway last one we have here this one is really truly special 
let's see. So open interest. Okay, this is palladium. All right. Well, we will we're gonna look for silver. Okay, so here's your open interest. One six seven eight eight zero. Um, now you're in for a hoot here if you haven't seen this one before. I don't even know why this is on there. It's like, there's got to be like some banker right now be like, why did Bill put this on there 30 years ago? So there's 5,000 ounces per contract. So 167880 times 5,000, that equals 839 million so around the mining production for the year. So 839 million ounces is the open interest. So what is interesting, percent of open interest held by the indicated number of largest traders. So by net position, um, four or less traders, four or less traders are short, 34.9% of the open interest. So 34.9% of 839 million is 292 million ounces. I'm assuming these are banks. Uh, don't really know which ones, although I might recommend people to check out Ted Butler's columns. He's the closest one to being, a, I mean, I'm a novice at breaking through this catastrophe of a report. Um, but anyway, you have uh, 294 traders, I'm assuming banks, 200 are short 292 million ounces of silver. Now, keep in mind, uh, I've heard some people say that basically the banks take receipt of the silver from the refinery and they are holding it for some period of time before it's sent to the industrial consumer. Um, so that's what that hedge represents. That seems like an incredibly large short position. I'm calling BS on that one myself. I can't say that conclusively, but... Um, at least this report shows that four banks, we don't know what offsetting hedges there may be. Although if, here's the thing. So let's say that the industrial user wants to lock in their price. So then that's offsetting the hedge. At the end of the day, someone's short the metal. But anyway, we'll do one last one. The uh, 839 billion million times 0.462. So the eight largest traders are short 387 million ounces. So put in other words, for every dollar that silver rises in price, these four guys lose $292 million, assuming there are no offsetting hedges. And these eight guys for every dollar rise in price lose $387 million. So basically these four guys, if silver goes up $4 would be out about over a billion dollars, probably about uh, what's that 13 uh, ish. Uh, I forget. So a lot, they'd be out a lot over a billion. Uh, if you have uh, 292, so it's almost 12, $1.2 billion. They would be out for a uh, $4 move. So last thing I would mention is that, A, if you want a concise uh, background of all of this, there is the big silver short available on Amazon, audio version available at arcadeeconomics.com. Um, and I guess the last thing that I would point along, point out, yeah, some of these facts uh, certainly seem pretty stunning to me. I would fully expect it's not going to be a straight path. So, I mean, there's going to be twists and turns. It's not a guarantee that this all unravels next week by any means. I think it's becoming in the conversation now. Um but I mean, the ending isn't written. And I think what's really exciting about what we saw this week is that 
people, to me, it seems like a great example of people took back some power and said, hey, we realize the banks have been uh, cheating people. We see the things that are going on. And I would encourage people to remember whether it's government or any of these things where you see something happening and you stand up, there's other people who are seeing it too. Sometimes people are just waiting for someone to take the lead. And um, anyway, we will be back here at 10 p.m. Eastern tonight, taking questions. So anything you wanna know, we'll be back here for a while. Thanks for spending part of your Saturday afternoon with me. It's quite a fascinating story and uh, appreciate so many of you being here and spreading this word. And uh, I'll see you later tonight.